Um, I'm going to start this morning off with a few more little introductory questions again for Erica to help you dive a little more deeply into who she is and her story and the way her brain works before we get to see a bit more of her work and be led by her um, in, into new creation and new stories, really. Um, Erica, we didn't ask much. You talked a little bit about you know when you discovered being an artist and and learning to draw. We didn't talk about whether you come from a family of artists. Oh, like, I mean, I'm sure your mother was surprised when you drew on the wall, but was she surprised that you drew it all? I, did your did, you, did your family um, nuclear or wider? Um, were they artists or people who valued art? Mm -hmm. Was that part of your upbringing? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. totally. Yeah, um, come from a my mom and dad teacher and pharmacist, okay. and uh, my dad was a musician. He played the clarinet, mm -hmm. and my mom <clears throat> was always sort of arranging and rearranging in the house and had a real you know kind of aesthetic side of her, mm -hmm. which I don't think there was ever the opportunity to develop, but she was always, you know, created beauty around her and was beautiful. And so, um, I, you know, I learned this, this care and respect for environment and space and, um, and, and welcome and hospitality from her. And uh, my dad's side of the family was both scientific and, med and medical, but also musical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, his sister... Uh, pianist uh, and other sister violinist. He right. was a uh, clarinetist, and um, on my mum's side, uh, brother Rhodes Scholar and um, um, and and uh, and eldest uh, sister, also very accomplished um, uh, teacher, uh, and um, uh, and so this this kind of double kind of attentiveness to both science and the arts mm -hmm. uh, from from both sides of, of, of my mom and dad's family and uh, and so my brother kind of got all the excitement for science okay and uh, and he uh, teaches at Stanford and okay. he, yeah. he's a He's a, an, um, he's a neo, his first specialty was neonatal, okay. and second specialty was uh, nephrology, and so wow. he's a wow. pediatric nephrologist, wow. and, uh, yeah. and, and deals with the, the um, hardest cases mm -hmm. in kid, kids' kidney failure all over the world. Wow. Yeah. So he's, he's pretty impressive, so I was always the, yeah, in his shadow. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and yet you can't say he's a scientist and I'm the artist because you truly do integrate both into your work. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. so excited about the brain mm -hmm. and our bodies and how we function. So we bought, both got that curiosity and we go, both got that deep respect. And he's also, you know, very deeply spiritual person. And, uh, yeah. And you both love yeah. teaching. Yeah, it's I guess. Of, it's part of who you are. Like, it's clearly, it's yeah. evident when you engage with Erica, that's part of who you are. Yeah. Because you are a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get really excited about things. <laughs> and want to share them with people. Yeah. And oh, that's what being a teacher is. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Who was the first artist or first piece of work that you remember really capturing your imagination? Mm. Seeing, like, this is art. This, mm. this is grabbing me. Okay, so... I was a little girl, and I remember walking with my mom um, in in two churches mm -hmm. and uh, going going to an early early morning mass at the cathedral in Regina uh -huh. and looking at the stained glass windows. <gasps> and we were going to take the train up to Saskatoon to see my grandmother, and I remember gazing at the stained glass windows just in awe of the quality of light and the quality of color. And as an even littler girl, I remember walking into the back of Little Flower Catholic Church mm. in Regina, mm. in what became the, you know, the wrong side of town where mm. my mom and dad had a, their first little house. And I remember as a little girl looking at the statues and looking and being amazed at you know Joseph holding the baby Jesus and Mary and, and whatnot and just just being 
kind of gobsmacked, you know. And, and, and they were like maybe a cut above the sort mm-hmm. of the, the typical the, the typical sculptural, you know, um, industrial made kind of mm-hmm. Italian knockoffs. Yeah. But it wasn't that it was mm-hmm. great art, but it was just this vocabulary kind of settling into my into my soul. And I remember, I remember lots of times, you know, thinking, you know, looking at the quality of light coming through stained glass windows. Oh, I could do that this way cool. with paint, yeah. you know, like, like, could it be captured, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can see that in your work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, with the encaustic, that was, you know, clearly kind of an attempt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is your gram- grandmother an artist? You talk about your grandmother a lot. Oh, do I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my Polish grandmother um, had um, English, but the main language was Polish. Okay. My mom never taught us Polish because mm-hmm. she didn't want us to be discriminated against mm-hmm. because she grew up with so much discrimination on the prairies mm-hmm. and, you know, mocked for the accent, and she had none, made mm-hmm. sure she had none, mm-hmm. and but she didn't want me to have any, so mm-hmm. or my brother, so there was no language. Mm-hmm. But my grandmother, oh my gosh, she, the house was filled with like little holy cards and little vials of holy water wow. from Lourdes, okay, you know? Yeah. Holy water in little containers, you know, that you could mm-hmm. wear around your neck. That's interesting, considering <laughs> your artwork. I know, I know, contain- I know. Yeah. My little water samples yeah. was a direct reference okay, to cool. that tradition yeah. within the Catholic Church. You know, and of course now I believe that all water is holy, mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, the water, and that we are water, mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. But as a girl... You know, looking at these little pamphlets and looking at the, you know, kind of icons around the house, you know, it was just magical for me. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she would, she was very prayerful. Prayerful, like she mm-hmm. would be. I remember her, you know, sitting with her eyes closed and clearly praying with intensity mm-hmm. and maybe ecstasy won't be quite the right word but almost like she was clearly in another world when she was praying and it was just so beautiful and I didn't need any language to understand that yeah yeah Yeah. that's really beautiful have you drawn her no I haven't no Mm -hmm. no Senya was her name Senya yeah my other grandmother was Mimi and she was very musical okay Mm -hmm. Okay. yeah both threads in that you know, as you mentioned, the vials and the encaustics, um, we saw last night through the slides, which you know I was watching everybody's faces from here, and clearly we could have looked at many more slides. In fact, I've got some great photos of people's <laughs> faces watching the screen. Um, as you went through, we saw some of the movement um, in shift of your work in your different stages and mm-hmm. you helped you helped us discern that but through different themes perspectives mediums materials mm-hmm. um, and you spoke a bit about how you yourself view that shift could you speak a bit more about the artist you were in those early years mm-hmm. in contrast or comparison to the artist you are today mm-hmm. yeah so the artist I was I guess for the first half was look was really interested in kind of an interior scrutiny or an interior investigation. It was it was really um, you know as as most young people do, you've got to figure out who you are. Mm-hmm. But it's this attempt to sort of understand what's going on inside of me, mm-hmm. and this contemplative, mystical. Of course, there's an outward element to it, but it was largely um, mystical, contemplative kind of an effort. So the energy was, you know, like my grandmother's lost in prayer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of this kind of Yeah. And 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 something was coming out of that place of interiority. Mm-hmm. However, that progressed to an invitation to be more attentive exteriorly yeah. Yeah. to see well what is going on in the world yeah. and what am I called to and what is leading me, what is calling me to pay attention to. And so first it was this theme of the ocean, mm-hmm. and it's connected to our embodiment, 
and 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 then it became you know the literally the the trees of the green belt yeah. <laughs> of the of the young little forest behind our place and it was a sense of the the it's sort of the wild the wildness of that green belt kind of calling mm -hmm. to pay attention mm -hmm. and so you know behind our place there's this teeny little strip of of um grass i suppose but a perennial border and then it's wild and so this is you know, intertidal zone between mm, 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 the perennial mm, border good, and the yeah. wild, and yeah. it's increasingly, you know, becoming a little bit blurry. Yeah. You know, the wild. And, so. Yeah. And, and it's sort of this attentiveness to what does intimacy with the earth look like? How do, what, how do I pay attention? And, and of course, all of the knowledge, then the research and the understanding about what's happening in the earth. Mm -hmm. What, how could humanity have 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 manifested a chemical shift that is changing the jet stream, mm -hmm. that is changing our weather, mm -hmm. that is headed in a direction which, which could make our species no longer here. And, um, Catherine Keller, just before coming, uh, read Catherine Keller's Facing the Apocalypse, and, you know, and, and she's all about looking at the last chapter of Revelation and saying, this is not prediction. Mm -hmm. This is, look, see the patterns. Mm -hmm. You have a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a choice, and the choice is right now. Mm -hmm. So we can make the choices yet to, so that hell on earth doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But if you look at where we're headed, if we make no changes, mm -hmm. six degrees of warming. None, no species will live that through that. You ask the scientists, very few will venture, venture to really say out loud what that means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It means none. No life on Earth. It's like planet Earth becomes Mars. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's not prediction in the Book of Revelation. That's, you know, see the patterns. Look at the patterns, and you have you can choose. You can choose to walk in a good way. You can choose to believe the scientific literature. You can choose to make the hard choices now. Mm -hmm. You can, you can, we can do this. We can change. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so. And so your work is sort of a visual, ver, ver, a visual voice of what mm -hmm. you just mm -hmm. articulated right. with, you know. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not imaging the apocalypse. No. I'm, I'm trying to woo with beauty and an and awe mm -hmm. and attentiveness, not out of fear, but out of love yeah. and, and paying attention deeply, mindfully, that, you know, that oxygen is. That is such a miracle, mm -hmm. such a miracle of unfolding, you know, from billions of years of unfolding. The fact that we have oxygen on the planet is sheer miracle, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, God's grace. The, the fact that we have water, you know, in, in terms of the, the long history of the Earth. And, you know, Tom, Thomas Berry worked with the physicist Brian Swim in the 1980s, I think, okay. to, to talk about, you know, the, the, the new physics that tells us, you know, we are stardust. We are, you know, the very materiality of the world, you know, originates, you know, divinely from the stars. That's where all the stuff comes from so we are stardust and mm. this long planetary unfolding is miraculous that oxygen is like the 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 chances of oxygen happening mm -hmm. and the catastrophe for the planet when oxygen happened is is anyway truly amazing so it's awe and wonder mm. that will mm -hmm. woo us i think yes. into change yeah. Given that, what would the Erica now say to the Erica back then when you were first starting, oh. first realized I am an artist, this is what I'm doing? If you could, mm. if you could whisper some words back to that Erica, oh. what would they be? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Um, there's a real key poem that says, um, you anxious one, um, 
don't you know I am with you? <laughs> Those are good words right there. Mm -hmm. well, why don't we pass us over to you with those words, mm -hmm. with the banishment of anxiety for all of us <laughs> to the thought of, of drawing. Mm. And for people okay. saying, I, I, am, yes. I am not by nature an anxious person at okay. all. I might okay. err on the other side. Ah, okay. However, something like this does bring out anxiety for me because ah. this is not so, something right. I've not been trained in drawing at all. I don't no. know how to do it. I'm no. a perfectionist. I'm self critical. Right. And oh, you're yes. going to, so you're going to yes, draw yes, it. And yes. I know I'm, I mean, stats say there's probably at least one or two of you out there who are like me. Like, oh that. no! Yeah, I have to yeah. do something that I'm not good at, yeah, and I've so never, never tried. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And okay. In. <sighs> Let's just <laughs> like let out that anxiety. So seriously, yeah. put your feet on the ground, and 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 let's like give our little shoulders a shake out, like get get that, you know, shoulders moving. And now let's close our eyes, and let's download all that anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, um, and just and just and and just befriend that anxiety and let that anxiety go <clears throat> and travel through your through your body and down into your feet and let that anxiety um, just drain away into Mother Earth, <clears throat> who can handle <laughs> our ener excess energy and anxiety. And now let's imagine. Um, that we have little teeny tel tender delicate roots growing out of the bottom where we're touching down. Um, everywhere we're touching down on our chairs, everywhere we're touching down on the bottom of our feet. And let's imagine this beautiful rootedness, this lovely yearning for Christ, this lovely yearning for the divine, just rooting deeply into the good earth. And let's imagine nourishment filling these little roots like little thirst quenching bits of water from the aquifers just moving up back into our body and replacing the anxiety with calm and with care. But but maybe that might be a little bit built, so we'll save that for 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 the next section. Okay, so first I'm gonna before we actually start drawing um, and and pick up something to work with. I'm just going to remind us about the Ian McGill Chris left brain, right brain. of our brain, but Ian McGilchrist mm -hmm. is this, you know, the, the neurologist who talks about the hemisphere theory. I'll just quickly run through it because I, was anyone not there on Thursday? Oh, okay, so I will review it, yeah. So left brain, right brain um, goes back a long way, but Ian McGilchrist is a neurologist who says everything that we've previously known about left brain, right brain is wrong. <laughs> we don't do things on different sides of our brain, like Betty Edwards, who popularized the brain research in the 1980s, built a whole drawing methodology on left brain, right brain. The methodology actually works, but the brain science was just baby beginnings. And so Ian McGilchrist has, is the neurologist who's done such like, like thorough, I mean, that's his, his life and his world, and his tomes about brain research are quite convincing in their research um, thoroughness. So he says that we use our whole brain to do everything. Mm -hmm. However, the two hemispheres pay attention in entirely different ways. 
the whole brain is used. It's a very complex system of networks which light up gorgeously all over the brain whenever we're doing anything. That the hemispheres pay attention in different ways, but that they nest and they need each other and the information gets passed back and forth across the corpus callosum, just like you know, Betty Edwards says in her book, you know, the corpus callosum, and information gets passed back and forth, either in isolation is problematic. So honestly, Ian McGilchrist talks about our, um, in the, that we are so enamored in our society with the left hemisphere way of paying attention, which is mechanistic, which is, which is um, instrumental, which is all these good things, as being, because it is focused on with the exclusion of the right hemisphere, it is the source of all evil in our society. <laughs> I kid you not. Like every wicked problem, you know, it is as a result of, in, in, in the Bill Chris I, in, um, text, because of using the left hemisphere in isolation of the right hemisphere, that ideally the two nest, the, the two need each other, the two fulfill one another, and either one of them in isolation brings on no end of bad things. Um, either, so uh, the left hemisphere, to um, uh, summarize it, basically helps us to manipulate the world, to comprehend it. Um, uh, whereas the right hemisphere helps us to apprehend it. So the right hemisphere is all about understanding, the left all about using. The problem is, you can use something and not understand it. You can manipulate something and get it to do what you want to do very well and, and not understand the, the complex ramifications of your actions. And you can still be master of the of nature, as Descartes said we could be, without understanding what we're doing, which is precisely what McGill Chris says we're doing in, in the Western world. Hence, the acidification of oceans. Hence, stalled jet stream. Hence, um, you know, uh, uh, white fragility. <laughs> Hence, you name it, go on. You know, racism, all kinds of ills is a part of not seeing clearly and not allowing our amazing facility with data and with logic to be nested within what the right hemisphere does does well. Okay, so um, so here are uh, the what what he um, uh, he lists as hemispheric uh, mm -hmm. characteristics. So today we're going to be um, focusing on um, these global, broad focus, flexible, whole gestalt. So as I outlined on Thursday, this narrow, uh, narrow, sequential, concrete, object-focused naming is what I'll talk about mainly today. Uh, things and facts, mechanistic, reductionist, either-or thinking, uh, linear, literal, all of those are good very deeply good. The problem is when the parts are not put together into their gestalt, into their whole, they, in their wisdom, don't see the whole picture. And they have, and, and the, the, the left, the data that the left gives us is absolutely essential. It's just, it's, it's just the, as McGill, Gilchrist talks about it, the left thinks it is sufficient. <laughs> and doesn't need the right. Um, and so the corpus callosum provides a, a, a way of blocking between the two as well as a way of facilitating. So just like Metaxu, Simone Weil, the, the wall between the two prisoners and the prisoner cells is both their separation but it's also their means of communication with one another. So the corpus callosum in the center of our brains is both our linkage as well as our separation. Because in order for for, for this to do its work, this needs to recede and shut down a little bit. And so when artists are working, when you're going to be working, 
I'm going to ask you not to be naming the objects you're drawing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be inviting you to be following the visual. So who who knows this? Who who is an artist and has done a contour drawing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so we know that when we're that when we're doing a contour drawing, our eyes are following the edge, mm -hmm. and in such focused intensity that we are putting aside the naming. And when your brain is naming, your brain comes up with a, a, a name, a symbol, and wants to go on to the next piece of data. So the left hemisphere is very efficient, and that's a good thing. In order to get through all of our days, if we stared at every object <laughs> like my one-year-old grandson and my three-month-old granddaughter do, who would get anything done? Honestly, it might be a nice world, but we'd get nothing done. So, so seriously, this on its own, just as bad as this on its own. Yeah. We need both. So naming. So you're the, the philosopher William James talked about pre-perceptions. And these are these stored symbols that we have. If I asked you all, OK, draw an eye, draw, draw a tree. You know, we might come up with a stereotypic symbol or an eyeball, you know, iris, pupil, blah, blah, blah. But when I look around this room, as Betty Edwards says, I'm almost quoting Betty Edwards now, every eye on every side of every nose is entirely different. And if you shift your head a little bit, the shapes change. I don't know. Who could track all that data, yeah. honestly, and still function? No one could. But when you're trying, you want that level of attentiveness. You want that level of detail. So that level of detail totally frustrates the left brain. But William James tells us that the left hemisphere has these stored symbols, these shorthands, these codes, that's names, speed, observation. The pro and Kant talks about this too. So we have these intuitive perceptions that we then process and come to a categorization. But with art, you want to stretch that time before intuition and categorization as long as possible. And that's what we're doing with blind contours. We are looking so long and so hard, it's going to frustrate the heck out of your left to brain. And that's almost <laughs> a, quoting Betty Edwards, like, right, you know, almost exactly. So that will frustrate you. And then you have to exercise holding that frustration. And, 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 and not stopping, mm -hmm. letting that frustration go, mm -hmm. like down through your feet, and then continuing on with, with the, how I'm gonna instruct, it'll be very, I'm gonna instruct you to look in a very particular way. And it's gonna seem very odd. And you're not gonna be looking at your page when you're drawing. So um, all those kinds of things. So I'm gonna go back to this slide. And so, and so, so, when, when the left hemisphere is naming, it wants to then go on. But the right hemisphere allows us to linger. So this sustained focus is what we're going to be doing with blind contour. Um, we're going to be um, looking so hard and so long that it's going to really frustrate you. Um, so even though the left is about focus, which we need in a society because you know, with social media, focus is a real big thing to develop. But we're going to really go past where the left is comfortable into the territory. That opens up cognitively different parts of your brain. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, you could be drawing in an fMRI machine and different areas of your brain will be lighting up. And you have all of your brain for a good reason. God wouldn't have made you this way if it wasn't necessary. And so the next, the second drawing we're going to be doing is really looking at Context sensitivity, the whole gestalt, and interconnections. And it's all about relations are primary. So these beautiful objects, if you can see them on the floor, the front row probably can. Um, these branches in particular, they got laid out so beautifully. Thank you very much. Um, the, the branches are gorgeous. And primarily, because the, the shapes around the branches, when it's all laid out, you can see the shapes that kind of um, hold the branches in their particularities. 
And so the branch is not independent from the shape of the negative space that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. So our second drawing is going to be all about this gestalt. So in when, when we teach in the studio, we our curriculum kind of covers it all. But this morning we're going to do sustained focus and we're going to do context sensitivity, mm -hmm. which we call negative space studies. And so these are some of my notes when I was reading the Gilchrist and, and getting all nerdy about the Gilchrist. <laughs> <laughs> and so the left brain physically kind of manifests some of this, that the right brain actually is longer, wider, larger, heavier. It's not actually symmetrical. It kind of nests around. Um, and, and then the right hemisphere has more neurons. It has larger neurons. It has more dendritic branching. It has more dendritic um, overlapping. So therefore, its ability to be interconnecting so that's its, its, its real brilliance, is it can inter interconnect. It can see analogy and metaphor, similarities between things brilliantly. And, it, and you can see it there in the physiology of the brain. So more white matter facilitating more transfer across the regions, enabling attention um, to the global picture. So, so the way our left and right hemispheres are actually constructed manifests these gifts and the giftings. So your brain is actually structured to have all that good stuff that allows for this global gestalt. And gestalt is a word from psychology that means that the whole is more important than the parts. And so that's the thing with you know, global warming. It <laughs> doesn't matter if the economy needs this. It's the global picture that needs to take precedent. Um, as, oh, I'm blanking on his name, um, used to be Bank of Canada, went to England. Mark yes, thank you. If we don't get this right, there won't be an economy. So, yeah, so, we, so this applies not only to artists, it applies to all of us. Okay, so pre-perceptions. The thing with pre-perceptions is it's very easy to become stereotypes. And so we plunk a stereotype, our brain gives us a name, it plunks a stereotype literally in front of us, and we go on to the next thing. And that's where stereotype comes from, because we're not seeing clearly. We're not really seeing what's in front of our eyes. We're ignoring large parts of things. And as, as the trauma stuff from Thursday night, you know, especially if our amygdala goes off and we're like, like traumatized by something, we are pushing down and trying to avoid and trying to deny and, and no end of not paying attention and being in deep denial. So all of this needs to be bypassed by engaging this back and forth motion between the left and the right, mm -hmm. passing the information through the corpus callosum mm -hmm. and then seeing clearly and calming down and letting the amygdala settle. And so with drawing, we're sustaining our attention. We're seeing slowly or we're seeing spontaneously. We're seeing in between. We're seeing the value. So we're slowing down and directing the attention. And so this is the curriculum for Art 181. Literally every week, we do one of these things, and it's like training for the brain. Or if, we're, if we were, if we were um, musicians, we'd be doing scales or archipelago. You know, I mean, we'd be doing all the exercises. I can't even remember what they're called now. Arpeggios. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think I ex uh, used a water word. You did. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, seeing value. So the slide about value was, was you know, like, like the problem with our, per the problem isn't with our perceptual apparatus. It's seeing in the context. So, so if you extract something from the context, you can't, s it, there's no truth mm -hmm. here. So sustaining attention is contours, um, seeing slowly, seeing spontaneously is gestures, seeing in between is negative space, seeing value is a va value study, seeing context, negative space and composition, seeing the whole composition. Dawning of the aspect um, is, uh, is uh, uh, Wittgenstein's 
application. Um, I'll show that in the next figure. Ground shifts. Anyway, it goes on. Metaphor, analogy, coincidence of opposites is um, the Gilchrist has a whole chapter on that. Uh, so, open curiosity. And so sustaining attention, seeing slowly. So this way of working comes from Kimla Nicolodi's Betty Edwards uh, popularized it in the 1980s, and, and more recently, Daniel Pink, <clears throat> in a whole new mind, I mean, now, I think it was early 2000s, said, why, why right brainers will rule the future? <laughs> and he actually took kind of a Betty Edwards workshop, who, her son is still is like, teaching her original workshop in New York, and he had this big aha experience, and, and anyway, so that's a little bit of where it comes from. This is kind of what a blind contour looks like. And so you can see the detail. You don't necessarily recognize what it is, but you see these flashes of gorgeous attentiveness. Like, look at the line quality. And then when you, you can kind of see a, a leaf emerging. And this was a student of mine <coughs> who did this drawing, I think, two semesters ago. Uh, her name is Rachel. And so the, the dark and the light and the exquisite sensitivity of the line and what she's doing is she has an object. What what we're going to be doing all together is mm -hmm. have an object in your hand, and you're going to angle your body, and you're going to have your hand on your with your pencil on your paper. And as your eye follows the edge, recording um, wherever the line mm -hmm. goes, your hand will be recording what your eye sees at the moment of seeing it, mm -hmm. with exquisite sensitivity to light and dark to angle, direction, distance, and changes of direction. And so lots of you, lots of you, I know, I can see in your eyes, you know this. <laughs> um, and, and you're just following the data, as if you're on a journey, and you don't care where you're going, and you have that openness, you know, to follow wherever it takes you. Um, and, and your pencil is recording what your eye sees at the mm -hmm. moment of seeing. And, and they're exquisitely beautiful. You don't necessarily recognize what it is, but the line quality itself is a track of the quality of your attentiveness. If you can connect your hand and your eye, and if you can you know, um, track the quality of the edge, if you, can, if you can record what your eye sees at the moment of seeing it. And so Kim and Nicolodes, when he was teaching this, would have people work this way for literally three months before he would let them even glance at the page. And the drawings were absolutely exquisite. Mm -hmm. And by that time, they were becoming very also realistic because the attentiveness of the eye and the hand-eye connection was developed to such an extreme sensitivity mm -hmm. that going at the same slow pace re re resulted in a very realistic drawing as well as an exquisitely attentive drawing. Okay, so that's our first way of working. That's called blind contour. Um, the second way of working is going to be seeing the in-between spaces. So everybody look at your hand. Hold your hand up. So uh, most of the time we would focus on our fingers of our hand. But I'd like to invite you to focus on the spaces between your fingers. Now, in, now take a look at the space between your thumb and your forefinger and focus on the space between instead of your hand. Do you see how that shape kind of pops forward a wee bit? Mm -hmm. Now compare it to the shape between your forefinger and your middle finger. See how that's a really different shape? Mm -hmm. Holy Toledo. What? <laughs> There's no name to that shape. And now compare it to the shape next door to that of the in between the middle finger and the ring finger. And then the shape between the ring finger and the little finger. So each of those shapes are really different. They're narrower, wider, they, they widen, they, they come towards one another, they end with different shapes. So, so when we're looking at the negative spaces instead of the positive form, um, they're unnameable. We don't have ready-made preconceptions of what these shapes look like. So therefore, we see them more clearly. Therefore, our drawings will be way more realistic, really much more quickly. And so the next thing with negative spaces that we do is we, we begin to go to the spaces outside of the hand, in between the hand and the format edge. 
um, and then we really get huge shape recognition. So in psychology, these kinds of diagrams are very common. Do you see this mm -hmm. drawing as a bunny? Okay, does everyone see the bunny? Does everyone see the duck? Yeah. Okay, you see the duck first? Yeah. Now shift how you're seeing it so you see the bunny, so that the beak becomes yours. Okay, ah, we see it now. Ah, so that response, ah, Wittgenstein talks about that as the dawning of the aspect. Isn't that a lovely term? Where all of a sudden you're seeing things that you didn't see before. That's what we need to do with our society. Ah, I get it. There's a gestalt. Who knew? I'm not independent in the world. Ha, I'm a symbiotic relationship with the whole globe. Okay, so with this one, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> so do you see it as a vase? Mm -hmm. Now, on the other side, do you see it as two profiles looking at one another? Mm -hmm. Ah, OK. Two profiles looking at one another, and now the vase, the goblet, the kind of medieval goblet in the center. Um, so this we shift. When we see the two faces, it's kind of hard to see the goblet. Mm -hmm. And then, you, so have the goblet come forward? And now have the, fa the profiles come forward. OK, so that's what you've got to do when you're drawing. So instead of focusing on the beautiful branch or the edge of the branch, mm -hmm. you're going to have the spaces pop forward. And you're going to draw the spaces. You're going to let the branch look after itself. You're going to attend to the spaces around the branch. Mm -hmm. So I liken this to the space is filled with the presence of God. <laughs> you know, this, the shape of the space is the shape of the divine supporting us, surrounding us, literally mm -hmm. hugging us. Okay? So what we're going to be doing is valuing these beautiful negative spaces mm -hmm. and, and drawing them. So that's the second thing. But Wittgenstein talked about that as being a form of knowledge and being very important in terms of how we understand and how we make sense of things and that that is a very important of new knowledge perception. Big thing in the academic world. So this was a slide I showed on Thursday night about the value. So the, the value here and here is identical. What is shifted is the ground. So that figure ground relationship. McGill Chris talks endlessly about this, this shift because we've been taught since Descartes and since you know, a mechanistic viewpoint that you can study something in isolation. That there is a sense of the individual. I get to choose. I get to, well, we do get to choose, and that's true. But we are also in relationship. And relationship also is integral. It's not one or the other. It's both. It's not either or. It's both. It's not one or the other. But to attend to the context is something that we're forgetting. So McGill Chris talks about the only world that any of us can know then is what comes into being in the never-ending encounter between us and, and whatever it is. What is more, I will claim that both parties evolve and are changed through the encounter. It is how we and it become more fully what we are. The process is both re reciprocal and creative. So he says, and this is a really big claim, attention is actively creative of the world we inhabit. If we look at the, the forest and we see a resource, we, we act differently in the world than if we look at uh, Kristen's land and see all our relations. Um, and so we create the world that we attend to, I think, you know, is a way of slightly simplifying his point. So the coincidence of opposites, uh, creatively, it's this generative power of opposites, that opposites actually reinforce one another. And so the power of creativity is getting beyond this either or way and 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 allowing the the tension of the uh, of the opposites to result in something new. Um, and that paying attention is gateway. So this, this popped up. Richard Rohr sends out a daily meditation. And it's always so uncannily ex exactly what I'm trying to figure out. And so, and so this popped up the other day. 
The way to any universal idea is to proceed through a concrete encounter. The one is the way to the many. The specific is the way to the spacious. The now is the way to the always. The here is the way to the everywhere. The material is the way to the spiritual. The visible is the way to the invisible. We see contemplatively. When we see contemplatively, we know we are fully in a, in a sacramental universe where everything is an epiphany. Everything is a watershed, is a, the author. So, okay. So, let's get to some drawing. So, I'd invite you to come to the front and to choose um, one object that will fit in your hand. Many of these objects will overlap your hand, but that's okay. Um, just choose one. And, and with the branches, you can see the beautiful negative spaces on either side of them. And um, there are a variety of um, objects which have been gathered from by the team. Thank you very much, team. So just kind of choose one. Just sort of, you know, just whichever intuitively calls out to you, just pick one object and bring it back with you to your place. And, and then what? I'm going to go look at it when you've been looking at your drawings, but um, yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of thing that we do, and and it is like an athlete learning. It is like a musician learning. It is a practice, and it's a daily practice, and we get better at it as, as we get better in our confidence. And it is a confidence. Oh, and the last thing I want to say is in the studio, we use both left and right. Um, we will be immersed in our making in the right hemisphere, and we literally have to shut down our left hemisphere to give us permission to try and to fail and to experiment and to work in different ways. But then we re-engage the left as we look at what we've done, we assess it, we make some decisions, we, we do make some compositional decisions, and then we go back into making. And then that is this modeling of the transference of the information back and forth across the corpus callosum to eventually arrive at a gestalt hole of a, a piece that's on the wall in a gallery that makes you gasp. <laughs> that is the process of making. It's like antiphonal call and response. It's, I think I'm doing this, I'm working, then I get back and I reassess, and I work some more, and I reevaluate, and I make decisions, and I work some more, and I mm -hmm. toss my idea, I follow what's happening. You know, mm -hmm. that's the process. Mm -hmm. That's the process, the creative process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.